Hey there, Ryan Dossie, and in today's video, we're gonna talk about how you can get into real estate or real estate investing with no money down. When I was first getting started in real estate myself, this was a super interesting topic to me, well, because I didn't have any money. Let's dive right in. Before I dive into these concepts, we're not running like YouTube ads or anything to try to build this channel. We grow strictly based off of you liking the videos, subscribing, and sharing them with your friends. So that's all I'm gonna ask. If you're enjoying what we put out on the content, be sure to like and subscribe. Let's get into the video. There's several different ways that you can go about getting into real estate without any of your own capital. And I figured the best way to go about this is to start at like the most straightforward, kind of the most simple, and then get into kind of some of the more complex strategies and what some of the pros and cons are with both. So the first strategy I wanna talk about is just straight seller financing. So how this typically works, you have somebody who owns a property free and clear, so there's not a mortgage or anything they have to worry about on it and they are going to sell you the property on payments as opposed to like for a lump sum. Um, I had an old video that I'll link to above be forewarned the quality is going to be terrible <laughs> compared to what you're watching right now. But we've used this strategy successfully to purchase things like single families and even some small apartment complexes. The great thing with it is everything's negotiable. So the interest rate you're going to pay, if there's a down payment or not, how long they're financing it for, a lot of the times people will do like a balloon where they'll carry like payments for you for maybe like three to five years and you have to refinance or pay them off. Other times it's like for the life of the loan, like you're going to be making them payments for the next 30 years. There's honestly not really that many drawbacks with seller financing um, other than one that I'm going to save for the very end of this video. So make sure you stick around for that. It's kind of a drawback with all of these strategies. So you don't want to miss it. The second way that people often get into properties with no money down is through a process that's known as subject to investing. Now, this one's a little bit goofy in the fact that you're buying the house subject to their existing financing. Um, so it's kind of like you're going to step in and make the payments on their behalf. A lot of folks think this is like an assumption of the mortgage, which is different. An assumption of the mortgage is where you actually work with the mortgage company to get the loan transferred into your name and out of the seller's name. With a typical subject to transaction, the like title of the property, the mortgage, is actually staying in that seller's name. So they're technically the one that's on the hook for the payments, even if you're making them. There are definitely some risks and drawbacks to subject to investing. Uh, one of the big ones being that loan is still in their name. So while right now they might need out of that property, what about three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Most folks don't have the kind of income or assets necessary to qualify for multiple mortgages. So this is kind of one of those strategies that I look at as maybe it's good for like a short term situation but you don't wanna like ruin someone's ability to ever buy a house again for as long as you have that mortgage out in their name still. Another one of the big risks with subject to investing is what's known as the due on sale clause. So all mortgages have this provision that basically states when the property is sold or like a majority of the equity is transferred, basically somebody's doing something with it other than just living there or renting it out that they can actually call that entire mortgage due, you typically have like 30 days worth of notice. So you might get into the property and the bank says, you know, hey, the seller is no longer living there. A lot of the times how they catch this is if you change the insurance to add you or remove the seller because the lien holder always gets notified about the insurance stuff. Or if you start sending in checks a lot of people are like, well, the way around that, you know, you send in money orders, they don't know who it's going to come from. In theory, like banks aren't in the business of calling mortgages due. They like to get paid. So if they're getting paid, there should be no problems. But it is still kind of a risk factor that's out there with these of the bank might say, hey, you've got to pay this off now. Um, a lot of folks that like sell courses around this subject will tell you that it doesn't happen. 
My recommendation, hop on biggerpockets.com and their forums and just search do on sale clause and you'll see tons of instances where people did get called on. The next one is a little bit controversial and it's what is called lease options. So how this works in theory, you are like leasing the property from the seller for a period of time with the option to buy the property for a set dollar amount. So you're kind of like renting it with the ability to buy it. Often how folks utilize this strategy is they'll find what they call a tenant buyer. So they'll find somebody that ultimately wants to live in that house that doesn't have perfect credit. They'll collect a down payment from that person and they'll put a, they call it like a sandwich lease option. So they might lease a house for $1,000 a month with the option to purchase it for 100 grand. And then they might turn around and lease option it to somebody else where the person's paying maybe $1,500 a month in rent and $125,000 if they want to execute the option. Now, normally they're collecting a down payment from these folks. And this is where I'm not a huge fan of this particular strategy. It's not very often that folks are able to actually get their credit or their ducks in the row where they can qualify for a mortgage. The typical term these are done for is about a year or two. So it ends up being kind of just like a down payment collecting farm where you're constantly kicking people out that thought that this was gonna be their house. That's not to say that there's not times where it doesn't go well, but a lot of the times that I've seen this strategy used, it doesn't end up panning out in the benefit of kind of the tenant buyer that's hoping to end up owning that property, where they also get a little sketchy. Um, some of the folks that I've seen who sell courses on these is they'll recommend you put like in your lease option with the seller that the seller has to do any repairs over like 500 bucks. How's that really fair? right? Like you've taken over control of their property, but you're going to stick them with any big bills. Like it, not to mention you kind of run into the same drawbacks of a subject to agreement. Like who's going to make the mortgage payments. You have to make sure if you're paying them a lease payment that they're paying the mortgage on it. And then on the flip side, if it goes for two, three, four, five years and they want to buy something else and can't because they're under contract with you, you're not really leaving them better off. I'm not gonna like get up all on my high horse and pretend that I've never used a lease option or a subject to deal structure, but I personally use these for short-term transactions where we're gonna have the person carry their financing on it for like three to six months. Um, I'll link to a kind of virtual wholesale deal uh, we did that we made like 60,000 bucks off of that we did utilizing a lease option, but in that instance, I've always used it when I'm more like flipping the property, not trying to keep it as a rental or cash flow off of it. Because worst case scenario, if I don't execute my option and they get the house back, I've remodeled it, right? Like that person is definitely gonna be better off than they were when I first found them. You can always make the argument like, yeah, you're getting them caught up on payments, fixing their credit, whatever. Well, if they have great credit, but can only get one mortgage, I mean, it doesn't really benefit them that much. So. I personally utilize those first two strategies when it's more of like a short term situation where I don't want to tie up all that capital to do a flip. Or maybe it's a, like a $300,000 house that it's not worth it for me to tie up 300 grand to try to make 30, but it is worth it for me to invest, you know, 10 to 15 in construction costs to try to make 30 kind of a thing. So that's how we've used those strategies and how I'm personally comfortable with them. The kind of like elephant in the room that I alluded to beforehand that anybody who's interested in these like no money down real estate investing strategies needs to be aware of or keep in mind. Um, I've been where you're at. Like you want to get started in building assets and building cash flow and building wealth, but do you have reserves? If I'm being totally honest in my personal situation, when I was looking for these deals early on, I did not have the reserves to handle a major repair. It's great if you get into a house with seller financing or a lease option or something with no money down, but what happens when it needs a roof and it's $8,000? Or if the HVAC fails and it's 5,000 bucks? There was a deal early on that I was trying to negotiate seller financing on, it was a house. And I was really, really close. It didn't end up panning out and I was super bummed. Like, man, I thought that was gonna be my first rental. In hindsight, it was a huge blessing because any issues that came up on that house, I would have been in trouble. If I had to do an eviction, um, 
You know, imagine owning something right now with COVID going on and you can't rent the house out and the person who's there is not paying you. Can you afford to pay that person for months and months and months on end while you try to get it figured out? So I think that's kind of the elephant in the room with these strategies, like the due on sale clause on a subject to deal. You know, if you've got the capital to, if that gets called, you can write a check and pay it off. Awesome, right? It's not really a risk to you, but a lot of the folks using the subject to method don't have that capital or they're using subject to because the person's underwater or doesn't have enough equity where if that gets called, they're going to then get foreclosed upon and they're way worse off having done business with you. So that's kind of how I look at these. Like you've got to still have the reserves, even if you're getting into it with no money or very little money down. You don't want kind of that like lease option structure I mentioned where you're pushing all the repairs on the seller because that's just not mutually beneficial and quite frankly, I think a little bit sketchy. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Um, this one I think might be a little bit hotly contested, but this is my personal view on it. The way I look at real estate investing and business in general, I want every person that I interact with to be better off having worked with me, not end up in a foreclosure because I didn't have reserves. Appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. If you found it helpful, all I ask again, be sure to like and subscribe. We'll talk to you all next time.